morning, and thanks for joining us this morning at Trinity Church. Welcome, especially if you're a guest with it or a guest with us. My name is DJ. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity, and this morning it's going to be my privilege and pleasure to open up God's Word and lead us in our study. Of it. We are currently studying the Book of Matthew. Uh, here at Trinity, we love the Bible. We have a high view of the Bible. We believe it's how God speaks to us, how He makes Himself known to us. And so we want to dive in and understand it. We want to study it as it was written. And usually that means we go through books of the Bible verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, seeking to understand them in their context, in the context in which they were written, and then apply them to our lives in the modern world today. And that has us right now going through the book of Matthew. So if you have a copy of the of Bible, I invite you to take it out. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, and we will be in verses 33 through 37 this morning. Uh, also, there, if you didn't get a listening guide on your way, a little sheet of paper with some space for notes that has our text in it, you can slip your hand up, and Alex will come from the back, make sure that you get one of those. Uh, and if you don't have a copy of the Bible with you this morning, there should be one somewhere in the seat rack in front of you. So Matthew 5. 33 through 37. We're in the middle of a study we call uh, Long Expected, Unexpected King. The Israelite people, the Jewish people, were looking for ages and ages for the promised Messiah who would come from God to save his people. And finally, Jesus bursts onto the scene, but he doesn't look like what people expect. And here is where one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, we're getting teaching from Jesus about what God desires, what kind of righteousness he desires from his people who are going to follow after him. And this righteousness also does not look like what people would expect. See, Jesus is looking at what was commonly thought in his day to be righteousness. He's looking at the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he's saying, if you want to be righteous in God's eyes, if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness must exceed even these. And he's offering us this, this higher bar, this higher calling, this way forward. And going through various pieces of life, we've looked at uh, anger, we've looked at lust, we've looked at marriage and divorce last weekend. And this weekend, we're going to be talking about the truth, talking about oaths, talking about being people of our word. Now, our species has always had a, let's call it a complicated relationship with the truth. It comes out in a variety of ways, right? We can look at so many different avenues of life. Let's take parenting. For those of you who are parents, you know, it's weird at my house. Pretty frequently, we have messes at home. Messes pop up in various rooms of the house. But if we take a straw poll of the three kids, nobody has ever made a mess in their lives. Yet they still keep happening over and over again. I'm not exactly sure where they come from, but it just it makes you wonder. Is, is everybody really telling the truth here? You don't have kids, but if you turn on the TV and watch the news, you certainly see this reality at play, right? We have politicians who can't make it through one speech without a whole team of fact-checkers to go over everything that they're going to say. We've got cable news channels who frame a story in just the right way so it appeals to their target audience, whether on the right or on the left. We have so many stories being shared on social media that are no closer to reality than the latest Marvel blockbuster that just hit the so we see it in our families, we see it in our relationships, we see it on the news. We can even see it on the basketball court. You know what you can tell a lie without even having to say a word at all? Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a video that's going to illustrate what I'm saying. So everybody, let, let's take a look at this. We've got an exciting game between Miami and Chicago. Post up down low. and Oh, that looked bad, didn't it? <laughs> Took a couple <laughs> right to the face. Oh, he's in a lot of pain right now. Pretty, pretty miserable feeling. I tell you what, let's go back and let's look at that again. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm no scientist. <laughs> but I don't think he ever actually made contact with his face. <laughs> and it gets better and better every time you watch it. All right. So even on the basketball court, we see the truth getting embellished just a little bit because you need to have a foul call. You can go ahead and flip on to the next slide. How long is that? Well, it probably wouldn't surprise you. To hear that God's word has a lot to say about how we should approach telling the truth. 
In fact, one of the Ten Commandments is about it, right? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is basics. This is following God 101. And the people of Jesus' day, they knew that God was concerned with truth-telling. And as Jesus has been doing in his famous sermon all along the way, he's telling them that while they might understand that God cares about the truth, they don't understand it quite as deeply as they should. And I would say we don't understand it quite as deeply as we should. Jesus is telling them when it comes to being a person of your word, the bar is raised and needs to be raised even higher. So we're asking the question today. What does it look like to be someone who tells the whole, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in a world that's full of lies? In a world that's full of lies in your house, in a world that's full of lies in the news, in a world that's full of lies even on the basketball court. What does it look like to be someone who tells the truth, who is a man or woman of your word? We're going to dive into Jesus' words this morning, and we're going to find out. So join me. Matthew 5, as I read verses 33 through 37. Jesus is teaching, and he says, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Pray with me this morning, and we'll dive in and look at this text together. Our God and Father, God of truth, we come to you this morning, and we ask that what we know not, you would teach us. What we have not, you would give us what we are not, you would make us by the power of your Spirit to the praise of your glorious grace. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we pick up right here, again, like we have the last couple weeks, in the middle of this sermon. And Jesus is following the same pattern that if you've been following along with us these past few weeks, we've heard again and again. He starts out by encapsulating the common understanding of his day of what righteousness looks like, right? The, the pattern all throughout the sermon has been, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And so when he gives us that you have heard it said, he's, he's telling us, this is what you understand righteousness to look like. This is what you think it looks like to be getting it right in these areas. And so today, he says, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So in this case, he says, when you swear to do something, you should do it. That's, that was the common understanding of what righteousness looked like. Is when you swear an oath to do something, you must do it. Now, when we hear mention of swearing today, our thoughts usually run to four-letter words that you don't say in polite company, right? This is not that kind of swearing that we have in mind here. The Bible does have something to say about profane speech, but, but that's not what's in view here at all. We're talking here about vows, about oaths about proclaiming a truth that you are going to do and then following up and carrying it out. Swearing of oaths was a very standard practice in the ancient world. If we open the Old Testament, we see this pattern, we see this happening throughout the text. It was a way of calling God to hold you to your word, right? That's what you're doing when you swear, is you say, I am, I am standing here before God that if I am lying, God is to call me to account. He is my judge. He is ever-present. His justice is perfect. Nothing can escape his sight. And so when I stand here and I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, I'm saying, before God, what I am saying is true. And this is why in the Old Testament law, if we go back and look through the law of Moses, it was actually commanded that those were to be taken in God's name as opposed to swearing by the name of any false gods of the nations that surrounded the nation of Israel. Right? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 20 through 22, says this, You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God, who has done for you these great and terrifying things your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. 
We see it again in the book of Joshua, Joshua 23, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it either to the right hand or to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them, but you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. So translation, what is the law saying in those two cases? When you swear an oath, swear by the only one who sees all, who hears all, who knows, knows all, and who is king and judge over the hearts of men. By him you shall swear. By him you shall make your oath. And as Jesus indicates here, in verse 33, when someone took an oath in this fashion, when someone swore by the name of God, God was very concerned that they would keep it, that they would fulfill what they had sworn. Leviticus 19.12 says it very clearly, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Numbers 30, verses 1 and 2, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel, saying, This is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So, when you swear an oath, you shall keep it. And did you notice the result of oath-breaking in Leviticus 19, when, when God says, You shall keep it, lest you... Profane the name of the Lord. When you make an oath, when you swear an oath in God's name and you break it, the result is you are profaning the name of God. Why is that? You ever sit down and think about why that is? Because when we swear an oath before God, we're saying that he is my judge. He knows the truth. He knows all. And he is judge over me if I do not fulfill this oath. And so we, we swear this with our lips. But then when we break our word, we turn around and live as if God doesn't see. As if God isn't going to judge. As if I can get away with what I want to say. We say one thing with our mouth, that God is Lord and King and judge. But with our actions, we say, but he doesn't see. But he doesn't care. Justice is not something I have to worry about. And it is a profanity. It profanes the name of God when we say one thing with our lips about him and another thing by our actions. It's hypocrisy. And God is a God who is true and faithful and just at all Time. So oaths were serious business in the Old Testament law. There were a few <coughs> verses that did not mince words. Very clear, very straightforward. But at least oaths were supposed to be serious business. Because in the world that Jesus is speaking into, in the culture where he's addressing here, just like it, we looked at with divorce last week, the people had over time taken God's commands and creatively reinterpreted them to give themselves a lot more leeway to get away with what they wanted to. So, for example, they had kind of invented this system of oaths and this hierarchy of oaths where someone, if they swore by the name of God, that absolutely must be fulfilled, and if you didn't fulfill your oath, you're found guilty. But if you swear by heaven, well, technically you haven't sworn by the name of God, so those verses in the Old Testament aren't binding on you. You can swear by heaven, but if you break that, well, too bad. Or if you swore by the, the gold of the temple, well, maybe God lives in the temple, but it didn't say anything about the temple, so if you swear by the temple, you're not bound by that one either. So they had this system where you could swear things that sounded really holy and divine, but if you minced your words just right, you weren't bound by it. It's kind of like the games we played when we were kids, right? Where if you cross your fingers behind your back, you can say whatever you want. Ha <laughs> ha, gotcha. Or you could say, cross my heart, hope to die, but if you leave off, stick a needle in my eye, then that's not binding. Right? It's these silly games that we played when we were kids. Well, these are grown adults, and they're kind of doing the same thing. They're playing with words so that they can get away with what they want to do and yet still be seen as righteous in the eyes of the culture. So while the people Jesus is preaching to here had indeed heard it said to those of old, you must fulfill your oaths, they were also very familiar with all the culturally approved means of getting around that vow, getting around that command. They were, they were well-versed in how they could say just the right thing to get people to do what they wanted, but then do a little sidestep and look out for their own ends. This is the reality that Jesus is speaking into here. 
This is the context in which this word and what he's about to say in verses 34 through 37, this is the context in which that is given. It's important to note that here. It's always important to understand context when we're reading God's word. But especially so here, because a lot of people have taken this command we're about to give and made some really weird, weird interpretations and applications. We don't want to make that mistake. We want to understand what God is saying, what Jesus was saying to them, and when we understand what Jesus was saying to them, we can understand how to apply it to our situation today. So what does Jesus have to say to this reality, to the, the present reality of a world where you should fulfill your oaths, except when it's inconvenient, right? That's the world that he's speaking into. What does he have to say? Well, he has to say this, verse 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Well, that's unexpected. We just read a lot of verses that say, you shall swear by God's name, you shall do this. Jesus is saying, you've heard it said that you shall fulfill your oath, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. What? Do not swear by heaven. Do not swear by the earth. Do not swear by Jerusalem. Do not swear by your own head. What is he doing here? What, what is Jesus saying? Let, let's unpack this a little bit. To sum it up, what he's saying here is that the truth should be so central to us as followers of Jesus that oaths actually are irrelevant, that they don't even matter. So he starts by saying, do not take an oath. It would have sounded to the people, and it would sound like us with all the verses we just read, that he's like overturning the law of Moses. And yet, in our sermon series, we noted just a few weeks ago, Jesus said that he's not come to abolish the law, but to Fulfill it. It's not going to pass away. He's calling us to a greater righteousness. So what is he doing here when he says don't take any oaths at all? Is he actually forbidding all oaths, all swearings, and canceling out those commands we read in Deuteronomy and Joshua? Some would say that he is. In fact, as a result, some people refuse to swear an oath in court because they believe it's a violation of what Jesus is saying here. In fact, in 1695 in England, they passed the Quakers Act which was passed to accommodate the Quakers, a religious group, who, because of this text, believed they could not, in good conscience, take an oath in court. And so the Quakers Act allowed them to, instead of swearing an oath, to make an affirmation, to affirm that everything that they were going to say was true. So are they right to do that? I mean, on a surface reading, that would seem to be the case. Jesus says, do not take an oath at all. Pretty open and shut, right? Remember what we said a few minutes ago about context. It's important to remember the culture into which he is speaking this. And he's addressing a people who have made creative ways to reinterpret what the Old Testament clearly said. And I want you to notice, based on what we just said about, you know, if I could swear by heaven, it's non-binding. I could swear by the temple, it's non-binding. Notice the examples Jesus gives to illustrate why somebody shouldn't take an oath. He says, first, in verse 34, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven for it is the throne of God. Nor by earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now a good and righteous Jew in Jesus' day would not swear by the name of the Lord and then fail to fulfill what he had carried out. Because that would be in blatant disregard for the law, for all the commands that we just read. But it was thought that one could swear to heaven and break an oath that sounded sacred on the surface, because it was not actually swearing by the name of the Lord. You're not actually running afoul of the law if you simply swear by heaven. Jesus is setting out here to crush that line of thinking. Right? Swear by heaven? But heaven actually belongs to God. You're not dodging his authority by getting creative with your vocabulary. Swear by earth? Yeah, that's his too. Swear by Jerusalem or the temple that's in it? Yeah, that's also his. It's the city of the great king. Jesus is saying that God owns it all. So just simply changing the word doesn't get you out from under the authority of God, who sees all, who judges all. And then his next illustration would seem like it changes direction, where he says, And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. So he tells them not to swear by their own head. It might seem at first glance, like if I swear on my own head, that I'm trying to get out of the realm of God's authority and just placing it on myself, taking my truth my oath on my own head, removing God from the equation, and I'm not breaking the law if I break my oath. But Jesus then goes on to point out, your head is actually more God's than it is yours anyway. 
Because he says, can you make one of your hairs white or black? Can you change the color of one of the hairs on your head? Now, if my son were sitting up here, this would be the point where he'd say, well, actually, mommy colors her hair and does this. And, and I'm going to say, though, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that nobody in here has a box of hair dye on them and, and can whip that out and put it in right now. So, right now, can any of you change the color of your hair at this moment? I'll, I'll wait if somebody wants to, to try really hard and give it a shot. <laughs> Jesus is making the point. You say you're going to take this on yourself, swear by your own head. You can't even change the color of your hair. You can't make a gray go back to black or a black go to gray. God is in control of your head. God is the giver of life. He is the one who is, has you under his authority. So what's the point? Any broken oath. Any false word profanes the name of God. Because there's nothing you can swear by in this world that's outside of the realm of God's authority. He is the true and righteous judge. So Jesus is telling these people, quit playing these silly games. Quit playing and parsing out the spiritual equivalents of pinky promises and this and that so that you can emphasize when you're telling the truth. And just simply tell the truth. Simply be a man or a woman of your word. Don't try to think about what you can do to get away with falsehood, but instead be like God who loves the truth and who never lies. Jesus is saying that it is better, if, if the focus of your oaths is what exactly you can get away with, then it is better for you to never swear in the And what's the alternative? Here comes the stinger in verse 37. This is the one that cuts right to the core. Let what you say simply be yes or no. <coughs> Anything more than this comes from evil. Jesus says, let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no, and you'll be in good shape. And all of these extra words and, and oaths and constructions that you put on top of that, they come from evil, because you're simply trying to ask, how can I get around this? Or, as a person who's established that my character and my word are not worth much, how can I emphasize, okay, I really need it this time? How can I let people know that, well, I didn't tell the truth of those 15 other things last week, but this time I really, really need it, and I want to get what I want. So if you're following Jesus, and you're pursuing this greater righteousness that he describes, your word should be so good that oaths become irrelevant, that you don't need them that you can simply say yes or no, and the person that you're talking to will understand he means yes, she means no, and trust what you have to say. And, and by the way, this isn't a new development. I mean, it's tempting to see, okay, Jesus is overturning this, and the Old Testament was about laws and oaths, and now Jesus is, is throwing that out and saying simply say yes or no. God was concerned about the truth in the Old Testament too. And we see it obviously with the, the passages we read about swearing, but notice what he says elsewhere. Like take, for example, the book of Zechariah. He says, these are the things that you shall do. So command coming from God. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath. For all these things I hate, declares the Lord. It's a beautiful simplicity. There's a high calling in that, right? Simply speak the truth to one another. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Don't love a false oath. Render in your gates, in your public square, in your courts, in your, in your congresses, judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts with one another. Don't sit at home scheming for how you can get away with breaking an oath so that you can take somebody and get what you want. All these things I hate, says God. In fact, disregard for truth, and by extension, disregard for your neighbor who you tell falsehoods to, throughout history has been a chief reason for God to visit his people in judgment. Look at the book of Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah reflecting on what is coming in God's judgment upon Israel. He says, let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother. For every brother is a deceiver, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. 
They weary themselves committing iniquity, heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me, declares the Lord. And as a result, God would send his people into exile. He would remove his covenant blessing from them. Instead, punishing them and, and urging them to return to him in repentance. But there we have a chief reason, because they didn't speak the truth. They lied to one another. They deceived one another. And all of this are various ways that we fall short of the second great commandment that Jesus reminds us of. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you will speak the truth. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, you will speak the truth. Whether you're under oath or whether you're just in everyday conversation, you will be someone whose yes means yes and whose no means no. The truth and keeping your word should be the regular and consistent hallmark of your life if you're a follower of Jesus. That's the point that he's making here. So does this mean that an oath is never appropriate? Like, if I'm speaking the truth all the time, then I should never have to swear, even if I go to court, all of that. Are the Quakers right? I would suggest to you, no. Oaths can be used to emphasize the seriousness and the solemnity of a particular situation. Like, for example, being in a court of law where someone's freedom or life hangs in the balance. How do I know this? How do I know that oaths are still permissible even under Jesus' teaching here? Well, because the Bible shows that Jesus' followers, even under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, still continue to take oaths on occasion. Right? Galatians 1, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatians, verses 18 through 20, he says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remain with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you, before God, I do not lie. He's swearing by the name of the Lord right there. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. The truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. 1 Thessalonians 5.27, Paul's writing to the Thessalonian church, and he says to them at the end of the letter, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. You will swear that you will share this letter with everyone in the church. Paul puts them under oath. Again, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we even see angels continue to swear oaths, right? Revelation, chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophets. So what Jesus is saying here is not a forbidding of all oaths, of this kind of swearing before God. What he's saying is you should be a person of the truth, whether you're swearing an oath or not. Whether you're swearing by God or by heaven or by the temple or by Jerusalem or all of these things, it doesn't really matter before God. Be a man or a woman of the truth. Keep your word. Whether When you tell someone something, it should be irrelevant to them whether you swore an oath or not because they know they're going to do what they said they're going to do. You should have a, such a firmly established character and pattern of truth speaking and of fulfilling what you promise that people don't question you. And so you don't need to stack extra words on top to convince them of your righteousness. So don't get wrapped around the axle here on the serious, on the semantics of oaths. Instead, pursue Christ by being one who speaks truth to your neighbor in all things. Let your yes and your no be good enough to take to the bank. That's what Jesus is saying here. And you've heard it said, don't swear falsely. And you think if you skirt the outside of that command, that explicit command, then you're okay if you tell a lie. You're okay if you stretch the truth. But I say no. God sees all. God knows all. God is the judge of every man and every heart. And so let your yes be yes. No be no, and anything outside of that comes from evil, evil motives. Be people of the truth. Why? Because we serve and we love the God of truth, the God who never lies. And we want our character to reflect his. In the kingdom of God, we should look like the king. We should live like the king. 
So what do we do with this? What does it look like to be people who walk in obedience to this teaching today in our culture? Like we said at the beginning, we live in a culture much like theirs that, that, that has a respect for the truth until it doesn't suit us, and then we find creative ways to get around it. If I need to make a political point for my party, if I need to get out of having to clean my room as a kid, if I want to get a foul call on the basketball court, I do what I've got to do. So how will we, if we're obedient to Jesus' teaching, how will we look different? What is this higher bar that he's calling us to? Well, first up, ask yourself this question. Are you a person of your word? When you say you will do something, do you do it? On the surface, that feels like an easy question. I mean, we're fine church going forward, right? And so we would all say, well, sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't go around lying to people. I, I want to be upstanding and, and a good member of society. And so, yeah, I'm a person of my word. Well, let's break it down. Let's get real granular with it here. Because even though I like to think that I'm a person of my word, I don't have to dig very far before I start realizing just how far I have to go to have this kind of obedience. When was the last time you told someone, I'll pray for you? Did you? Are you five for your last five? That's always one that hits me really. It's really easy to say right when somebody's telling you about something that's going on or a difficulty they're having. Yeah, I'll pray for that. And then the next time I see that person, I'm like, oh, shoot, I never actually prayed for that. But if I'm a person of my word and I say I'm going to, then I should. When someone at work, at church, even at home asks you to do something for them, do you? When you tell your accountability partner or discipleship partner about a new practice you're going to institute to guard yourself against sin and pursue righteousness, do you make sure that you actually carry it out in the week to come? Now you might say, I'm not lying in those cases. I just forgot. It happens. I have a busy life and I said I was going to do it and I forgot and, and went on to something else. That's not the same as breaking my word, is it? It's not the same as breaking a vow. The text doesn't say he shall not break his word unless he forgets. I, I don't see that as an out in the Bible anywhere. If it's important enough for you to tell someone you'll do it, then it's important enough for you to do it. So do what you got to do. Put it on your calendar. Make a reminder on your phone. Leave a note on your mirror. Whatever your personal means of organization is, if you say you're going to do something, make darn sure you follow out. You follow through. If it's important enough for you to tell someone you'll do it, it's important <coughs> enough for you to do it. Don't let forgetfulness be an excuse for not being a person of your word. Prioritize it. It matters. It's important. And it's going to take effort. It doesn't come naturally, right? I'm not going to slip into righteousness this week. It's not how life goes. Be intentional and do the practical things you need to do to value your word as much as Jesus tells you to value it here. Here's one that we might not think is related. Are you punctual? Are you a person who's usually on time? Now, you're thinking, all right, is it a sin to be a couple minutes late for something? Like, what commandment is that? Like, no, it's not a sin to be a few minutes late to something. But I would suggest to you that if you tell someone you're going to meet them at 7, and they know you're probably only going to show up at 7.15, then I'd suggest that indicates you're someone who has trouble keeping your word in that area. If people understand, well, he says that, but he really doesn't mean it. How is that not the equivalent of the same thing we're seeing here? How concerned are you that the things you say are true? How often do you say or repeat things that you don't actually know whether they're true or not. When you talk about something that someone did, do you relate the truth, or do you assume what their motives were for what they did, and perhaps risk slander? Like, it's one thing to say, so-and-so did this, they did X, Y, Z. It's another thing to say, so-and-so did X because they don't really like that person, or they just wanted to do that. Don't, do, don't assume someone's motives if you don't know them to be true. Think carefully about what you say, about what you repeat. How certain are you that the things you share on social media are true? Do you have the same level of concern 
as you would if it was coming out of your mouth? When you come across a story <coughs> that reinforces what you already think or that will help you win an argument, do you think carefully and double check it? Or do you just say, boom, send, go, ha ha, I gotcha? Are you concerned for the truth even more than you're concerned for winning an argument? When you're in an argument, do you take the time to consider the truth? Do you take the time to consider that you could be wrong? Or do you already have the end in mind and whatever you need to say to get to that end to win, well, it's the price of doing business. Do you hard-headedly keep arguing the same point even in the face of compelling evidence? Even when you're convinced that what I'm saying might not be true, but doggone it, I went this far, so we're going to go the rest of the way. When you retell a story, do you embellish the details for dramatic effect? I'm not lying, I'm just embellishing. I'm just making it a better story. Do you touch up stories from your own past so that you look a little better than you actually were in that scenario? When you play sports, do you flop like Chris Bosh? Doesn't matter if the elbow actually hit your face or not, you're going down. When you coach your kid's team, or maybe you simply watch your kid's team, do you argue every single call? <coughs> Even if the ref got a better look at it than you did? What about when you watch your favorite team on TV? Do you complain about the refs every single game? I could be guilty of this myself, but sheer chance tells you that they're not going to be against you every single time. And yet every single time your team plays, well, the refs cheated us out of that one again. Does the truth matter to you? See, all these things that I've just talked about, they feel like little tiny things, right? These are the respectable sins that aren't going to get you called to the carpet in a nice time. The truth matters. And it matters in all these areas. And if we're going to be people whose yes means yes and whose no means no, these are the inches that we're going to have to fight for in our lives. Don't be content with being 90% righteous. If we're going to follow Jesus, then we want to root out all sin, all untruthfulness in our hearts and follow him and reflect him to a watching world. What do you do if you mess up? And, and you will, by the way. If you don't think so, then just give it till Wednesday. But what do you do when you mess up? And maybe you're sitting here, and one of the examples that I've given hits way too close to home. I promise you some of those arrows are, are aimed at my own chest. What do you do? You do what you do anytime you mess up. You repent. You come to God in humble repentance. You own it. Don't make excuses. Don't belittle it. I don't have to do anything to dodge my sin because I know one who can take care of it, who has taken care of it. I know that my righteousness isn't what's earning my acceptance with God. And so when I fall short, I can own that and I can freely turn it over to him, to the Christ who died for it. And your lives, whether they're big or whether they're really, really, really tiny, enough to put Jesus on the cross. And his grace, purchased on the cross, is sufficient for them. And sufficient for you. So when you repent, take refuge in the one who can never lie. The God that we serve is always one who keeps his word. And we can take that to the bank, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. That will get you to sleep at night. Because if I'm sitting here to wonder, God, I want to follow you. I want to be like Jesus but the road ahead seems like it's so long. I don't know that I'm going to be able to get there. The blessing that Paul just pronounced there, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, make you like Jesus completely and totally and fully, and may your whole spirit and soul and body, anything left out? No. Be kept blameless, perfect, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful. He doesn't say you're faithful. He says he who called you is faithful. And he will do it. You are imperfect. You will sin. You will fall short. 
but he will be there with grace and forgiveness every single time. He cannot lie. He's faithful. He will do it. Your quest to be a person of truth is not up to you. You don't have to do it on your own, by yourself, in your own power. As you strive for this greater righteousness that we're called to, trust in Christ. And he will sanctify you. And he will make you more like him, day by day, by the power of the Spirit. And that goes for areas of anger. That goes for areas of lust. That goes for areas of marriage and divorce. And that goes for areas of truth-keeping and truth-telling. The one who saves us is the one who sanctifies us. Jesus himself said in John 8, 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are people whose eternity is secure because of the truth that we know in Jesus Christ. Let's reflect that kind of truth-telling to a watching world and know that God keeps his promises and he will be there to save and to sanctify us moment by moment.